Okay, welcome everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this afternoon, Rodrigo Vargas uh, Fernandez uh, from our own uh, Department of Chemistry and Pathology. So, Rodrigo got his bachelor's degree uh, at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, or UNAM, in 2012. He then uh, moved to Canada to BBC, where he did his PhD in theoretical chemistry under the supervision of uh, Professor Roman Krams. Uh, he finished his PhD in 2018 and then moved to the University of Toronto for a couple of postdocs. So, uh, from 2019 to 2021, he uh, did a postdoc with Paul Wiener. And then he switched groups at the University of Toronto to join the group of Alon Asturian Kuvit, who's a very famous uh, professor at UMC working on the machine learning research for artificial intelligence. And just last year, we were really fortunate to have recruited him here to my master's in Department of Biology, where he is starting up his own research. So throughout his uh, PhD and postdoctoral work, uh, Rodrigo has been interested in machine learning and artificial intelligence. And today he's going to tell us about his uh, uh, new work, new research program uh, in the lecture entitled Molecules Representing His Graphs, a key to accelerating molecular simulations in the universe of design. Here we go. Where's yours? Um, thanks for the invite, guys. I'll try to keep the math like to the bare minimum. Um, so, <clears throat> as Alex pointed out, we... of course, not working. Uh, my research has been characterized into two main four areas. So it has been potential energy surfaces, generalization, quantum dynamics, and inverse design. Uh, because of time constraints, I'll talk to you about generalization and inverse design power through machine learning. So machine learning is really powerful and it has been proven an outstanding tool the last, let's say five to seven years. So that McMaster decided to open up position in chemistry and AI. <laughs> So the two main frameworks where machine learning has proven to be really powerful has been what I call direct design. Is I have a problem. Uh, I'll have to move forward. Do what Joseph did. So I have a problem, and usually we could run experiments or computational simulations and get an observable. And this could be resource demanding. It could be computational demanding. So if we know a few of those data points, few it's ambiguous we could actually try to approximate it with a regression model or a machine learning model. Depending on the complexity is the amount of the data, depending on the complexity of the problem is also the accuracy that we need. And probably the most important question is how do we represent our problem? Now, machine learning is also so powerful that we could do what I call the inverse design, which is try to correlate the observable to the input of our problem. Now, this framework of research also have some caveats. One is, is it the search or is it an algorithm that we have to design? What are the resources? This problem is uh, slightly more complicated, so we cannot allocate a lot of resources to solve this problem. And finally, what are the scientific biases that we're going to use to accelerate this framework? So this has been, let's say, like the main big picture of part of my research. And we're going to start with direct design. This is also the main topics of, the, of today's talk. So we have a molecule we could run as, again, experiments or computer simulations and mimic the energy. And our goal is if we have enough data points, we could actually try to do regression, right? I have two different molecules, we point to two different materials properties. And if I actually have enough information, I could actually approximate it with machine learning model. But what is a good representation of our chemical problem? Is it robust enough that it can plug a molecule that we haven't taken into account? Would I get a meaningful answer, right? So I told the students of 4PB3 that this is the real central questions and it's not well defined how to represent a molecule in a computer program, for a computer. You can actually ask my students. And today I'll talk about one that is pretty close to the heart of chemists, which is graphs, right? I could go to the audience and ask to draw the molecule of caffeine and you were gonna draw something like this. This is some sort of human bias of how we believe the atoms talk to each other, right? We have the oxygen atom talks to a carbon atoms, which at the same time, this carbon atom is some sort of linked by another carbon atom and the nitrogen. Maybe some people in the audience know more chemistry than I do, will draw more even uh, more properties out of just this simple diagram. 
But this diagram also comes from math, right? We could actually relate it to nodes and edges. This carbon atom is a node in a graph which is connected to a nitrogen atom, a nitrogen atom, and another carbon atom, right? So chemistry notation intrinsically is a graph. So why don't we use this to our advantage? A graph mathematically defined is just has two components, vertices, which in this case is the atoms, and edges, bonds. What we believe actually drive the interaction in our chemical, uh, in, in, our, in our molecule. So a little bit more big picture. What if we actually put those graphs into a machine learning algorithm? So the idea is I have a molecule and all I know is how the atoms are connected to each other. I put into a regression model and I get the property. Formally speaking, the only two sources of information that are giving these machine learning models are my atoms and my bonds. That's it. That's all we know even from the chemistry perspective, right? If I go back to the previous slide and I show it to you the connectivity to this molecular representation, you will be able to infer properties, right? Is it base? Is it is it base? Is it not base? Is it polar? Is it not polar? And vice versa. So we want to craft this type of algorithms where we just give them the atom and its connectivity, which is what we believe are neighbor or representative neighbors. And we're going to draw properties. Why? Because if we manage to do it, we could actually plug another graph and get the property. So I Google what are similar molecules to caffeine and paraxetine came up. And if our algorithms are so powerful, you will see that missing a methyl group would actually modify the property of interest. So how do we actually code machine learning models that actually get information through this graph construction? So the simplest example is we can go to methanol. So methanol is formed from three different atoms, right? We have hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. And we know which is its connectivity. For example, hydrogen is only connected to this uh, oxygen neighbor atom. So formally speaking, I have one hydrogen, zero, six, zero oxygens, and zero uh, carbons. But this vector encodes the information of this hydrogen. It would be one zero zero if it wasn't interacting with anything. But since it's interacting with uh, oxygen, one way to actually redraw information of it is, okay, let's average its information with respect to the nearest oxygen. And that's what I get 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and zero, right? Can go to oxygen. It gets more interesting. Oxygen is actually surrounded by hydrogen and carbon. So now it's internal information where I try to encode or this vector representation where it counts its information actually draws that, okay, it has a hydrogen that is neighbored, my own information from the oxygen and the carbon. And if we go to actually the, the only carbon atom in this molecule, you will see that we got something pretty interesting. This vector representation encodes that is heavily modified by the three uh, hydrogen atoms that are in this molecule. So we could do this many, many, many times, right? We could just take the same input, re-average, and re-average over and over. And we, the hope is that we were going to learn something. Obviously, if we just on average things, we're not going to learn anything. But what we could actually try to put is a neural network, where it's going to give me the information that I know from my atom, and it's going to give me a new representation of this atom. And it's only going to take into account its nearest river. So this is graph neural network in a nutshell. So all I'm trying to do is I'm going to take the information from my neighbors, I'm going to put it into the, this representation, and I'm going to pass it through a neural network, which eventually we're going to tune its parameters with the hope that it will learn something. So why do I mention this? One of the most interesting uh, chemistry problems is catalysis design. Right, Google and I can't remember the university throw millions of dollars last year into a challenge called Open Catalysis, and the hope was to craft the best machine learning algorithm so that we could drive design and accelerate the design of catalysis. So inspired by that research, we tried to come up with a way to reframe this problem also through machine learning. So how do is the standard way that we do absorption for catalysis? So we run pretty heavy quantum chemistry simulations. One of the problem with catalysis is that we have a metal plate. So we have to take a huge amount of atoms, right? And then we put an observant, we run DFT, for example. And then we ended up with a uh, reduced representation of our problem. What we believe is the, the final molecule that will drive the chemistry process. 
there is some way to actually speed up this and we could act we kind of we could reduce it into a graph representation now this according to chemistry it should contain the entire information of our process so if we have a graph we should be able to drive this process faster instead of doing the ft simulations try to pass it through machine learning so if the entire hope is to actually predict that substrate energy, we have three terms that we need to predict. One is the interaction between the absorbent and the metal, the metal and the absorbent molecule in gas phase. Out of those three terms, the one that is pretty difficult to do is the energy of that absorbent at the metal, right? Depending on the molecule and depending on the metal plate that we need to contemplate, it will be the problem that we're trying to define. So when we started this problem, we decided to plug some machine learning algorithms and try to predict things, and we failed drastically. But when we actually take into account that instead of predicting only this energy, we predict the difference between the absorbent and the metal and the metal, this becomes pretty easy to predict, and we could actually train highly accurate. So we decided to put a neural network that will predict this difference of energy. Why? Because we actually, now we could actually not interpolate, but I could actually predict for different metals. Right? This is the difference between the, the metal energy and the absorbent and the metal energy. So what are we hoping to learn? One is that this new framework of research will give us the relation between atoms that are connected differently. Second, we should be able to capture that if we decided to use different metals, this difference of energy will be different. And more importantly is what is the impact of changing the metal atoms? Unfortunately, there was no data set available. <laughs> so we needed to craft our own. And in order to do that, we also had a bigger goal in mind. Our goal is actually to do catalysis on big molecules. The problem is to crafting this data set is insanely expensive. This goes from hours to days of computing power to actually get a meaningful calculation for every molecule. So our hope was if we actually craft a representative data set with a small molecules, which we get its graph representation, we could trace a graph net and then predict the, the, the energy. And with the hope that this is powerful enough that we could extrapolate to big molecules. So our hope was we're gonna train with small molecules and let's see how it behaves with big molecules. Why? Because we could not waste years and years of computational time crafting a big data uh, molecules, a big molecules data set. So a little bit of input of what was the family of uh, molecules that we use. We have 3,315 total pair of absorbents and metals. This is composed of all possible interactions of the 207 closed shell organic molecules and 14 different metals. We actually split it into nine families. So we have nine families of organic molecules and 14 different metals. For all calculations, we consider three different uh, crystal structures for the metal. Why we didn't want to be biased to any specific crystal uh, packing. All, for those who are interested, all the calculations were done in DFT using the PBE and some dispersion corrections, okay? But interestingly, remember that I said that this difference of energy between the absorbent and the metal, and the metal was an easy thing to learn. Well, this use a unimodal distribution, right? This is easy. It looks beautiful. It's kind of like a Gaussian curve almost for all the families. If I were to remove that second term, this is the metal energy, probably I will have shift of energies between what metal I'm actually considering. So this is kind of what was backing up our hypothesis that this is what you should be learning rather than just the interaction between the absorbent and the metal. Anyhow, so we started with a 3D graph. Right, we did DFT, we put the molecule, we did the geometry optimization, and we ended up with a structure that looks like this. And through the last decades, uh, catalysis research has come up with pretty good algorithms to actually craft which atoms of the metal are interacting with that servants. So based on those actually algorithms, these are the graphs of the molecular graphs that we ended up as training data. So for example, for the same molecule, and different optimizations, we found that the copper atom is actually connected different. For example, here it's only connected to this carbon. Well, here it sort of form a bridge between the hydrogen and the oxygen. So these are all different geometries or not geometries, molecules that we could have that represent the same problem. 
So these are all included in our data set. We have different, different metals. And as you could see, even if you include the same molecule, we ended up with two different states in this geometry. Now, a little bit of results. So we considered 14 different atom, uh, metals. And average across the error of all of them, we see that we get a pretty good understanding of what is happening. Our average error is below 2 EV. This is absolute error. And in the case of the families, except for the automatics, we have also like a pretty good uh, absolute error. All of them are around minus 0.2 EV. We were asked recently in the referee report what was aromatic family was like so gigantic the error. And we actually went through the structures and we found that because they are geometrically more challenging, the descriptions require more data. So we have the same number of molecules per family, but the aromatic family is the family that has the largest atoms. So we are not including geometry. This is simply connectivity between the metal and the atoms of the observant. So if we have a bigger molecule, we should have a bigger number of conformers and maybe our space was reduced. So this was kind of our idea. Nonetheless, the error is, the error is pretty good, somewhere around 0.3. Uh, so I give away the answer. <laughs> uh, our final motivation was actually to deploy this for big molecules. Why? Because if you actually were to do this the proper way, doing DFT calculations, it will take you hours of weeks of high performance computing. Well, if we actually train a new network, we could actually use Google Colab to predict this, and it will give you milliseconds. So we consider five different biomass uh, molecules, plastics and polyurethanes, all of them with respective metal catalysis. We actually tried to mimic this to the industry literature. So we tried to look for five different examples that this was relevant. And by doing so, we found that our error is pretty OK. It's linear, has an R square of 0.82. And again, we, these 15 molecules will never include in our training data. So given only the connectivity between these atoms and the metal plate, it was enough for us to actually draw what is the energy that we are after. So this is the first chapter of the story. If we're able to represent graphs and molecules into a new network, we're pretty OK to do this process. Instead of doing the calculations of the experiments, we'd, enough data maybe we will actually be able to get an accurate result however the majority of us are actually interested in the inverse problem we actually want to draw a molecule that has my desired property that's literally the majority of the research groups who does experimental chemistry that's literally the main question right and i actually love this question a lot and the problem is that this is extremely complicated you are trying to go from a single value function to a vectorial function, just for those who like math. So there is a lot of possible answers, right, that could give us. But some of the problems that we face in this is the search space could be gigantic. So it could be even harder to actually fit this algorithm than to fit this algorithm. So why to do it? Second is resources. You guys do experiments. You can't do a million experiments so that I could fit them in the network. It will be completely useless, my approach, right? So the idea is we have to do some sort of data efficient search protocols. And finally, scientific biases, what are the things we are after? So this boils down to if I could encode the chemical space, maybe I could go from the function value to the real molecule. So is this actually the molecule I'm trying to decode? Inverse design is insanely correlated with something called optimization, which is one of my favorite research topics and probably the central idea of my research. And the idea is if I could decode from the observable to a molecule, I'll be able to do it. Fortunately, we can map this problem into an optimization problem where the goal is to actually find the minimum of some function. This case could be a target molecular property, right? If I want affinity, if I want toxicity, if I want something that I could actually evaluate, different molecules will give me that property. So let's assume we can encode the chemical space somehow, and it looks like this. So this is, let's say, toxicity for some family of molecules. And if I move in this direction, and in this direction, I'm just moving in the chemical space. My goal is not to know that region. My goal is actually to know this point, because that's the molecule that best represents my problem. The situation is, A, how am I evaluating that function? 
does it come from our experiment? Do I have noise, intrinsic noise in the way I gather my data? Resources. Can I, how many times can I actually evaluate my function? Yes, if I could do it a million times, maybe I just can do brute force search and I shouldn't be here. Second one is something called black box, which is the only source of information is the values of my function at the position that I choose. Or does it come from computer simulations? So we have to take all these things into account in order to properly select from the optimization toolbox. I love optimization and someone thankfully wrote a book finally in 2020 from one of my favorite optimization algorithms. And its starting paragraph is astonishing. Optimization is innate to human behavior. On an individual level, we all strive to better ourselves and our surroundings. However, optimization is pretty difficult, right? We all see it. We're trying to come up with better ways to improve the things we've been doing, even if we are experts on it. So we have to find better ways to do it. In the big picture, you can cl classify optimization algorithms into two big families. One is sampling. I just want to get the best next point. And there's some sort of model that we should quantify me what is the best next optimization. You could swap machine learning there for genetic algorithms. Right? In the case of genetic algorithms, you have a batch of champions, you select the best one through a fitness function, you permute, and then you do, you could do grid search. Grid search only assumes that any point is as valuable as any other point. So you could just put all of them at, in the same time. <coughs> However, if you actually have access to gradients, which is the derivative of the function that I want with respect to its input, then you could use the gradient as information source to how to navigate this space. And this gets me to one of the tools that has uh, that changed my research career through the postdoc to my from my PhD to my postdoc, which is called differentiable programming. So <clears throat> let's assume we have a way to actually compute a property, and we use a computational chemistry method. And our goal is to actually find the molecule that minimizes this function. So what if we actually compute that gradient, right? This function with respect to the molecule. One of the easiest example is geometry. If I could compute the gradient of the energy with respect to the positions of the atoms, I get the force. And if I get the force, I could actually optimize the positions of the atoms to find the ground state, right? So you are solving this problem. It's just that your gradient is in terms of the position of the atoms. And you're only interpolator, your, your chemical space is only for one single molecule. It's just you're navigating through the positions of the atoms. This is really powerful. It actually drives tons of decades of research to hand drive analytical derivatives for these quantum chemistry methods, right? So I could actually navigate to the gradient and find the most uh, probable molecule configuration. Has horrific equations, right? And this is for the simplest, the most vanilla quantum chemistry method out there. So good luck trying to code this. So, let me be a little bit more adventurous and say, okay, I do not want to take the gradient. I actually want to move in the chemical space. I really want to be able to change atoms. So we can go back to the Huckel model, probably the easiest semi-quantum chemistry model. And in the big picture, the, the Huckel model is a uh, computational program, which input is the molecule and is the atoms that are connected. So for benzene, for example, I have an atom of type alpha, and this atom only interacts with the type beta, and these two types. That's it. This is another graph. This is not different from a graph neural network, right? This is literally telling me that this two pi electron will only interact with this two pi electron and this two pi electron. And this is literally the information that we give to the Huckel model when we run calculations. We give the structure, we give the connectivity, and we tell what type of atom is connected to which other type of atom. So we have a computer program. We should be able to compute its gradient, right? If I could compute how much the homolumo gap change with respect to this parameter, then I might be able to vary what type of atom you are. So if you try to go the Huckel model, you might find some problems along the way, right? But maybe after a week, you'll say, oh, it works. Now, what about the gradient? <laughs> so you have to derive the gradients, and then on top of that, you have to go to code them, and that might be pretty complicated that you would like to abandon it. 
One of the things that get unmentioned of why machine learning became so powerful is that they tried to make this problem from the big picture. So in 1920, uh, 1990, Schmidt Hubert proposed the following bizarre idea, making the world differentiable. And the idea was if everything at the end is a computer program, if I'm just coding computer programs, why do not code a computer program which input I can compute its gradient with respect to? Then I could just easily tune all those parameters in my computer program and then therefore optimize it. This is my favorite representation of what is machine learning. It's a differentiable computer program that we could actually tune its parameters so that it learns what we want. This is what we did in the graph unit, right? I give it a graph, I give some free parameters, I cook up a loss function and using gradient descent, I optimize this sort of neural network. But it's a computer program which is taking derivatives and just using it to actually solve our problem. This is the field of differentiable programming. And differentiable programming is, could bypass the use of machine learning. It not only works for machine learning, you could actually use for chemistry. So let's assume I have this pretty simple yet complicated force sphere model. The cosine of the input A time, uh, plus the, 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 the multiplication of A and B. And I ask the students to compute its gradient. So Maybe through pen and paper, you will figure out that we only need three derivatives. We need the derivative of the product, the derivative of the cosine, and the derivative of the addition. We all know how to do it. The problem is when we have to do it sequentially. That's when it gets pretty complicated. This is the bottle. This is the core component of differentiable programming, that it would create a program that would follow these operations. And along those operations, we'll start computing those gradients so that automatically construct the grain that I'm looking for. I given only the evaluation of how to compute this observable and automatically because it's simply linear algebra, I can compute the code automatic, the gradient automatically. This is the back engine of all modern machine learning libraries. This is why you can train any type of machine learning architecture in all those three programs. So you don't have to switch from one to another. It's because all decided to invest heavily into how to automatically compute such gradient. So let's go back to chemistry. If our goal is actually to optimize molecule space, we could use quantum chemistry code. It's a program. If I put it into an automatic differentiation engine, I should be able to compute its program. So one way to actually encode the chemical space is to represent the atoms into some sort of probabilistic manner. So let's assume I have anthracene and I have these ghost atoms mark at X. And every single one has the possibility to be three different types of atoms, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphor. If I randomly sample them and compute the homolumo, I'll get the following histogram. And you could see there are some of those who actually have a lower homolumo. So naively, I could say, okay, if we get access to this gradient, I could actually search for this space of, of molecules faster, right? This is where we put automatic differentiation. If I could actually recode this or put this into a differentiable programming engine, I could tune these parameters. This is just simply another parameters from this graph representation. So let me explain this graph. This is every single of the ghost atoms, while the blue, uh, the, the, the blue triangles represent the probability of that atom being phosphorus, nitrogen, and carbon. And the green ones represent its gradient, how much the homolumo of this, uh, of this connectivity or this molecular framework would change if I actually set it to be phosphorus, nitrogen, and carbon. And if we actually plug it into a gradient-based algorithm, we could see that even though we started with a really bizarre and virtual molecule, I will end up at the end with a molecule that has a significantly lower homolumo and only one set of type of atoms for every index. There is no machine learning here. It's completely quantum, uh, quantum chemistry models. The only thing that I did is take the advantage that I could actually put gradients when I needed to. <clears throat> now, what is the difference between the virtual and the, and the visible? The visible is the molecule that at every iteration has the most probable atom. So I just take that one and just compute the homolumo so that I verify that I'm not doing pretty bizarre stuff. So how well does it work? Well, I could take some sort of random initial molecules 
plug them into this gradient based algorithm and just push the envelope of the Homo Lumo gap significantly lower. And this is literally saying that, yes, there is a configuration of atoms at every side that will drive the Homo Lumo to lower. If I wanted to do the Homo Lumo maximum, I could also do it. And we not only did Homo Lumo, we actually also did polarizability. So we can compute the, the property that we want. We could actually compute its gradient with respect to the type of atom that we consider. This is kind of like a big picture slide that I put when I interview here, which is deep learning has massively succeed in today's world because they created a way to compute uh, gradients to solve this problem, parameter optimization, independently of how we frame our machine learning algorithm. They say, you cook up a pretty bizarre algorithm. Don't worry, we'll take its gradients. So we have that part for you. Just focus on how to create better models. The, the machine learning libraries will take care of how to compute its gradients. So I kind of think that we should try to mimic that from the chemistry perspective. If we have pretty good physical models. Maybe it will worth to actually start playing around with them to drive the molecular inverse design. As you could see, you only take a handful of calculations to drive one of those optimal molecules. We could also do it for quantum circuits. So I'm looking for students. I got a massive opportunity from a student from Chile to come to my lab. He's a physicist. And we're actually trying to do the design of quantum circuits. And this is simply how do I connect these photon detectors to each other so that it, uh, it reproduces a quantum target state. And this is driven by a function called the fidelity. But the fidelity is simply, how do I connect things? Again, another graph. So we could differentiate graphs nowadays. And as you could see, we could end up with a quantum uh, optical circuit that says these two photons have to be connected with this red operation, and these two will have to be connected with this blue operation. Before I finish and wrap up, uh, science is never done alone. I have the privilege to work with really smart people. Um, part of them, the two main research projects that I showed to you were the main two projects that I was doing in the last year of my postdoc. <clears throat> this paper got today accepted in JCP. <laughs> so I got an email at 6 a.m. <clears throat> uh, so I'll put the link later. But I'd like to thank Alan, Robert, and Shell uh, for the massive contribution to this project. And the, the ICIQ uh, research group in Catalonia, it's kind of was a massively effort and collaboration to drop the catalysis project. They actually, Sergio came as a visiting student to Alan's group when I was transitioning here with the hope that instead of doing these massive, super expensive calculations, we could put neural networks. What we ended up learning is we needed more quantum chemistry than machine learning. We need better ways to do quantum chemistry calculations to have a meaningful data set rather than to plunk a machine learning algorithm. So it's still cool to learn chemistry. So why am I summary? Graph neural networks are really powerful and believe it or not, it will become more and more common. Why? Because they are natural to chemistry. Chemistry molecules are graphs. So maybe a graph representation is enough, right? Maybe you have enough data set, I could actually represent my problem or have a function that represent my problem. We were able to generalize to bigger molecules. Sure, it's not DFT accurate, but compared to the total time that it takes for my calculations, we were pretty close and we get a rough idea of what is the process behind. Finally, we were also able to generalize across different metals, which is really powerful because then instead of doing again, tons of a bunch of calculations, we could actually plug this. And finally, if we actually were to use the same tools developed by the machine learning people, we could actually reframe a lot of chemistry problems. One of them that I was pretty interesting was this idea of do inverse molecular design. Just use the same chemistry code that we, we know for decades and use it to our advantage to actually drive the search of, chemical, of, of molecules. One of the great things of this is we don't need any more analytic derivatives. So there is no need for us to actually sit down weeks and weeks to derive uh, uh, hand-derived gradients is more powerful than finite differences. So finite difference was another approach to actually compute uh, derivatives. And finally, we could actually start saying that we have fully differentiable compu uh, computational chemistry methods. This is, so thank you very much. Awesome. Okay. Uh, yeah, I got lots of questions.
Sure. So this shows that the error, you know, for example, for the catalysis part? Yeah, that's just like the uh, uh, This one. Just wondering, uh, to what extent is that dependent upon the training set that you prove that? Like, if you get rid of the training set, or is it kind of plausible because there's so many things that you're missing? So we are not taking account, uh, we're not taking account into account geometries. So we only have what atom is connected to what type of atoms. So the reason, for example, why the gas is horrific is that in a graph net, this molecule and this molecule is the same molecule. So we wanted to keep it bare bones. And the reason is we could put geometry here. The problem is if we put geometry, we really need humongous data sets. So the more information you put into your neural network or into your representation, the bigger the parameter space gets. Yeah. So we got, when we started this, we had like a thousand or so molecules and we saw that we have a pretty good error, but there was, that was our learning capacity. In order to actually learn more, we needed to have more data. And that's what we actually went back to, or we asked uh, nearest Nuria's research group if we could generate more and more data so that we have a better representation of this space. So we have, we included more metals, we decided to include different facets so that the, connect, the, initial, the final connectivity is slightly different. And we decided to put a thing at the end, we put it automatics, for example. So yeah. When you say second shell is Let me see if I could answer that question. We are pretty bounded to how we move from this 3D representation to this graph representation. So if we actually have a better way to say, okay, actually this hydrogen is in formally interacting with this copper atom, then we could actually include it. Because at the end, for example, here, uh, this hydrogen is not interacting with this copper. Why? Because we assume they were not linked. By this 3D geometry, whatever process that we did to actually construct this graph, which was done through tons of years of catalysis and insight. But if we have a better algorithm to actually move from the 3D space to the graph, then we should actually be able to capture that correlation. And believe it or not, this is a future project that we're going to work. We're gonna try to put differentiable programming to tune all the hyperparameters that move from this 3D graph to this 2D graph because they were done in the 80s. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Ah. <laughs> So when you say it's not differentiable means it's not coded right now in these frameworks? Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, so usually what people do in that case is, for example, this is what happens at ReLU. Is ReLU is the most, probably it's actually, we use it in the graph nets. You decide a uh, direction on the gradient. Sure, it's completely meaningless mathematically, but you decide if it's the absolute value, you just put a threshold in the function and you say, if you are above zero, you go here. If you are below zero here. Uh, no, I mean, you don't get garbage that you can train relus. Relus is literally 
zero or a linear function, and you have the maximum of both of them, which is the absolute value. Training secondary average, you get garbage for that gradient doesn't exist. But you can, I mean, you you don't get garbage so that I could train this. So, and this is, I understand. I, I got this question always. I, I love it. But for some functions, I'm not evaluating exactly at zero always. I just have a threshold between an if function or that absolute value, formally speaking, coding wise is a tree. So all I need to know is to memorize what will be the gradient in the right direction and the gradient on the left direction. So that when I start computing the gradient, I just know, okay, you come from this direction, evaluate this gradient. Sorry? So you just need to spin this. Oh, I don't know what is the smooth optimization, sorry. No. Okay, no, I do not want to put in that in that perspective. What I'm saying is, yes, absolute value of x is not differentiable, but it's differentiable everywhere else except in that little zero. So if you have to compute that, then you could actually use it. It's maybe when you really reach the zero point, and this is probably what a lot of people in the machine learning get, there are tons of problems where you have to train relus. That's the only example right now that I could think of, is that they have to do some tricks to not to smooth the gradient to move out of that nuns or zero value gradients. But okay. <laughs> yes, we only uh, consider neutron uh, complexes. This is Again, what I tried to mention that the power of people knowing the field for decades. So this D2 asterisk was actually a hand-tuned dispersion correction from Nuria's research group. So that's the reason. If they knew if they'd done calculation this for over the last decade, so they knew the inside outs to get meaningful results. R squared, this one? Yes, we could actually include geometries. And then, I mean, we have all the geometries. The situation is that if we actually were to include geometries, let's see. Our input space goes from three or the number of atoms to the number of atoms and X, Y, Z per atom. So it gets pretty complicated. You could not just do these tricks because when you work in the X, Y, Z framework, you need to account for permutations. You need to account for rotations and translations. So it gets slightly more complicated. However, we found that this architecture has the same results at the architecture that includes the 3D, the 3D information, which make us think that actually this is not a so bad representation for this chemistry, for this chemical process. Obviously, if you wanted to do not conformers but enantiomers, we will fail drastically. Like we will fail drastically. So we knew for this process or for this uh, chemistry, this was a pretty good input to the neural network. But if you wanted to do again, conformer search and you really wanted to discretize this and this, of course we will fail drastically. The follow -up yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, we couldn't run this on a quantum computer. Okay. So, <laughs> um, the first reason why we couldn't do such process is because 
we will have to actually do the same trick that we do with the dispersion corrections is we'll have to say, okay, let's take the valence electrons of this and try to run it. The second thing is, I think you start chunking the space of electrons so much that you ended up with a reduced meaningless representation. So yes, you could do it. Yes, there are algorithms. And I believe they would not be as, they would not be any better than what you get in DFT because of the tons of amongst, tons of the approximation you have to do to make the problem fit in a, a quantum computer. Yeah, but you That's a great question. Mm. Let me go to the end, sorry. This has to do with Simon's work. So all I've, all I've said is if I know how to tune the notes of a graph, its representation through gradients, then I get a meaningful representation. But I could actually tune its connectivity. And then I could actually encode different types of connectivity. For example, in the case of the molecular graph, I just assume we are bonded, end of discussion. But if you go to the caffeine molecule, there are single bonds, five bonds, and double bonds. So we could actually try to encode different representations here and try to pick the most meaningful one. So there is some sort of way to put environmental factors into the graph. It's just directly trying to link it into the connectivity. We could put information in the edge. Uh, in the vertices, sorry. So we could actually try to encode something extra besides you and I interact to each other is you and I interact and this is the information of our interaction. Does that answer the question? Network diagram. Uh, uh, this one? Or so the, this you, one. I know the numbers are different, but when you look at the network diagram you generate, uh, the nodes are the same size. Right? Yes. Do you vary the sizes depending on other best and um, the edges as well, depending on the strand? So the, the nodes as this vector has to be the same length for every node. And the reason is, it will be bizarre to compare apples and oranges. So if it's, in this case, it's an atom and it's a representation of what type of atom you are. If I have one atom that has, let's say, three units of information, and then another atom that has four units of information, there is a misconception because your representation and my representation are pretty different. So one way that you could do is to add a fourth unit in this one and just put it to zero. And then, that means you don't have any information of whatever it does for unit, but the other guy or the other node has it. So I should be able to learn it. So it's kind of the idea of this, this hydrogen only has hydrogen, has no oxygen, nothing. But if I allow it to, to inform from another node that does have that some sort of information that I could just re-update my information as, on the node. Yes? Go. Okay. We'll stop there and uh, keep joining and thank you for your reading. Thanks, guys.